मिस्टर सुचेता दलाल मिस्टर जादव बी एस सी प्रोफेसर वाइदनाल एंड जनरल सेक्रेटरी ऑफ दी विराट हिंदुस्तान संगम जगदीश शेट्टी वेल फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई हैव टू एक्सप्रेस publicly my admiration for sucheta dalal she because she took on the nse and won the case i did encourage her at one stage that she should fight but she got a lot of money and i got nothing <laughs> but this is what we need in our country fighters it's not always easy but in the end the law of karma does deliver i have not known anybody who is not benefited by fighting even though the short run you lose professor vaidana mentioned that if i stay in in economics i would have got i would have qualified for the nobel laureate to be an honor of nobel laureate my teacher and then later co-author paul samuelson had predicted five students would get a phase would get nobel prize over the next 10 years and i was one of them but four got it i did not because i made a decision i'll go back to india and teach economics there and do the research there because i found india more convenient america you have to do your own laundry you have to drive your own car you have to clean your own bathrooms and uh, my quality of life in india was much higher so i came but the communist school allowed me to teach here because they felt i was polluting the minds of the students and so first i was called by mr amartya sen in writing saying your gaddi is being dusted when i turned up in india at the congress had split the communists became partners of the congress they began capturing universities and he told me i'm sorry your views are not acceptable the letter meant nothing for him of course he didn't stay very long he went off leaving the country then i came to iit and i became full professor and for three years i taught but the students all insisted on knowing about indian history in the nuclear bomb all the things so i went to the dining room and then after that as the students assembled i addressed them and one day mrs gandhi picked up my book and said what kind of people today are in teaching in iit and then she read out my book that you can grow at 10% growth rate you can uh, produce the atom bomb you can reject foreign aid from foreign governments he says that this is the kind of thing that has been taught i said the socialism actually lowers growth rate market will raise the growth rate and she said i can't understand how the iit is made him a professor well next day at 5:15 i got a letter saying that effectively from 5 o'clock you are no more professor I went to the director. I said, "I am a full. Uh, I mean, I am a full time, full professor, and this is it's a with a comes with a you know. Uh, if you want to remove me, you have to go through some inquiry." He said, "No, I got orders from the top. You fight it in court, which is what I did. But it took me 22 years to win the case, and by the time I had become a cabinet minister, and so the day I got the." court order said this dismissal order is totally illegal so it never existed and so it i should be treated as if i have continued in service for the last 22 years so in iit i am been in teacher of iit for 25 years according to the <laughs> and all my salaries have to be given back now i am a cabinet minister i didn't need the iit but anyway i went to it took charge as professor for one day resigned the next day and said give me back my back salary <laughs> they said give us an account of how much you are you owed i gave them plus i put a 18% interest on it it's much more than i would have got as provident fund 
end of my retirement. I'm telling you this because fighting in the end brings rewards, but you can't expect to fight only for rewards. That's all he does. Of course, the IIT is still fighting, that 18% we can't give. So I said, no, uh, let's continue the fight. So the longer it takes, the bigger the amount will be ultimately, because I'm going to win that case anyway. In the meantime, uh, I became parliament member. I was, uh, we, Janta Party came to power. Muraji Desai told me I'm appointing you on the board of governors of IIT Delhi. So I said, the very body which dismissed me, how will I face all those people who, who, who uh, participated in the, my dismissal? So he said, no, don't worry, I'll take care of the, I've dismissed all of them. <laughs> so I got my sweet revenge. And I'll get a lot of money in the end when my will the court case. And it all worked out very well, but nobody could have predicted. Because most people who came from America went back to America. And I didn't want to do that. So I had to choose between Nobel Prize and I had to choose between the country and I preferred the country to the possible. <laughs> now we have to make this country a great country. And one of the biggest disease we have, which is affecting in many dimensions our country, it's a major national security threat. It's not just some people being illegal and getting money. It's really corroding the country. One of the reasons I've taken up this, this Sunanda case is because it came out of black money. She was going to expose how the IPL was a money laundering unit in which her husband participated. And she was killed by a gang on a supali. A lot of people are involved. And yesterday, you might have read today's papers, that judge, he won't even let me speak. Because we are in the final stages. And the previous judge, who had heard me for six times, had finally told Delhi police, next year he will tell us, are you going to charge sheet the accused? or you're going to close the case. That's all we are going to consider next time. And it would have happened. But I don't know how mysteriously that judge was transferred to another bench and came, came a bench, uh, a judge about whom I will not say anything publicly now. But after some more research, I shall call a press conference and say why he was so harsh to me. But it was totally unfair because he wouldn't let me speak. He asked me for facts. I said, but we have only come to discuss whether the Delhi police is going to close the case or register, uh, register uh, I mean, you know, charge sheet the people. He said, no, no, I want to know why you said this, all well, irresponsible and so on. What, why don't you mention that you are a member of the BJP? I said, the whole world knows I am BJP. I mentioned I am a mem member of parliament. Because those are official positions. Party position is no, nothing to be mentioned in it. But the whole idea was that I was unraveling this IPL black money thing. And somehow the Sunanda case must not move forward. And of course it will move forward. And uh, I'm not, I never give up. And uh, so therefore, I'm giving you an illustration. The protection of the facilitation for black money has gone so deep that it is something which needs almost a total obsessive focus of the country. You don't know what all you have been going through. Potholes on the road are because of corruption only, nothing else. It is not that we can't build roads, we are building all over the world. We built such lovely roads in Malaysia, in, in, uh, in Nigeria, in uh, Iraq. You mean you can't build a road here? Even here in some parts we are building very good roads. National highways in parts are superb. So therefore this corruption is giving you a substandard product. 
Subs corruption is giving you adulterated masala, adulterated food. It is ruining your health. What's put in the oil, what's put in the milk, it's all the adulteration. It's because they desire to make quick money. And therefore, they have somebody else has to be paid, so they have to recover that. It's a whole chain. So what is good about Professor Vaidyanathan's book is, I've listed uh, four important merits of the book. He and I rarely agree on anything. <laughs> the reason being both are Tamil Brahmins, we never agree on anything. <laughs> I mean, we are Brahmins because we are in the field of education and we have no money. <laughs> that is the qualification of a Brahmin. Tyagi and Gyani. <laughs> Not today somebody is working as a director. Not somebody who is today working in Bata Shoe Company and says I was born as a Brahmin. You see. That was a division of labor. And uh, if you are a Tyagi and a Gyani, you become a Brahmin. Vishwamitra was born in a Kshatriya family and he became a Maharishi because he became a Tyagi and a Gyani. Anyway, so first uh, mer uh, merit of this book is that surprisingly, this gentleman, whom I hold in high regard, I, I, he is not, he's not only a full professor, but he should have been our economic advisor. And uh, the only reason I was given why he can't be made economic advisor is that he's too blunt. Well, that's what we want. But today all advisors are rubber stamps. And if uh, the Prime Minister says, can I do demonetization? They won't tell him, we are not ready on this, we are not ready on that. Let's take a little more time or GST. No, no, we can't rush through with it because you haven't got the computer program yet. Uh, the GST is not ready. The advisors do not tell him. And then they say, no, everything is fine, we are ready. And then you see what, what, is, what the results are. So we wanted a person like him. And I'm sure that he will come very soon. The things are going. And some, somebody told me that he, he was a very witty teacher and a great tennis player. I didn't know you played tennis. But that's what somebody told me. But then I said, you got it wrong. He was a great teacher and a witty tennis player. <laughs> so, first good thing about his book is that there's clear inform definitions. What is corruption? What is bribery? What's the difference? You see page 14, you see definition is clear. Second merit of this book is he's got excellent reference materials at the end. All websites he has put down. So if you want to really read the book and then do the research, this book is ideal for that. The third thing is it's less than 175 pages, which means you can read it in the one sitting. And I'm addressing those who want to read the book. <laughs> but it's very easy reading. Printing is super. The, uh, the spacing is excellent. So it's very easy to read. I read it on this flight uh, from Delhi to Bombay. It just took me two hours. Uh, of course, I already knew the material because you've discussed it so many times. And finally, I find that he has only priced it at 350 rupees, which is quite low by today's standards. And uh, therefore, in all these four, it's eminently viable, and I certainly strongly recommend it. He has answered some key questions. I am, what he avoided in the speech, I am now going to bring out from the book. How much black money? That's your question. Well, he has made out one distinction which needs to be made out all the time. There is no such thing as black money per se. There is a flow of black money and there is a stock of black money. And black money can become white and become black again. Supposing I got black money in my pocket, I go in a taxi and I pay the taxi driver. 
It's black money with me, but once he gets it, he has earned it. And it just becomes white money. And he can even report it. There will be no difficulty for him to report it. So, it, the black money, there is a flow and there is a stock. The stock is in your house, in your, under your pillow, or something like that, or abroad somewhere. That's the thing. So, how much is the flow? According to him, 15 to 30 lakhs per year, correct? I don't know why you didn't say it. What were you? A little shy that it's too low a figure or something? <laughs> and then he says the stock is 65 lakh crores. Well, some people say it's a little more, but anyway. Now, but he has not given what is the share of Sonia Gandhi and Chidambaram. <laughs> Black money menace come to this country. People say elections, elections. No, no, not elections. That are much later. The first big monumental mistake we made was to introduce the Soviet economic model. And that required quotas and licenses. And the quotas and licenses were administratively priced. As a result, if you got a quota to import something or export something, or you got some quota for scarce material like cement or something, you could go to the black market and sell it to somebody who wants it badly. So soon a bunch of uh, Touts came into the picture. They had access to the minister because they gave the minister also some money. And they ensured the license is given to a particular party. So the party which wanted a license did not apply straight, I mean, did not go and uh, apply and then wait for his uh, being called. But they contacted these touts. The touts then, for a cut, went and were able to persuade the minister to give the license and the quota, or they went into this black market uh, and sold it to the highest bidder. That's how the whole thing started. And uh, when Narsimha Rao abolished quotas and licenses in one blow, what happened? All the people who are touts had joined the Congress party because it became easier to get it from the minister. They all turned against him. If you look at the economic record of Nasima Rao, it's unparalleled. The growth rate was 3.5% per year, which the, the communists used to unfairly call as Hindu rate of growth. It's actually a communist rate of growth. <laughs> It was the same growth rate in uh, Soviet Union, the same growth rate in, uh, in East Germany, it's the same growth rate in North Korea. Wherever there was communism, it was only 3%, 4% growth rate. So this 3.5% growth rate, in five years, he converted by year by year to a final of 8% growth rate. Is that it was the economic miracle of that period. Now, the biographies of uh, Narsimha Rao say that the blueprints were prepared by me in the Chandrasekhar government and Narsimha Rao took it and implemented it and the credit went to Manmohan Singh. Now Manmohan Singh as five years finance minister did so much economic reform but at ten years as prime minister he did nothing. <laughs> How is that possible? The credit belongs to Narsimha Rao and I told the Prime Minister the man deserves a Bharat Ratna at the next competition. <laughs> Manmohan Singh's only contribution I know as a Prime Minister is he did not resign during the 10 years of the UPA. <laughs> because had he resigned, you know who would have been the Prime Minister? The Yuva Prince today. <laughs> whom I popularly refer to as Rupudu. <laughs> so by not resigning, we must save that. But the fact is, 
Narsimha Rao lost the election. Why? Because these touts immediately lost their black money. Whereas the beneficiaries were told it will all filter down. And these people then did the propaganda, this is all for industrialists, rich people, so on. And in the election, the Communist Party was half in its, became half in its strength, in its, uh, its uh, parliamentary strength. And Marsima Rao lost the election. <coughs> Mr. Atal Bihari Bajpai committed the same mistake of a different kind. But the, the, the form of the mistake was the same. He concentrated on what he called as growth and he called India shining. He even advanced the elections by six months because he listened to these people in Delhi who are now called as called Lutians. The most dangerous people, they will spin mythology after mythology. Ah, you have been hands down, you sweep, your strength will go, you get absolute majority. But in the case of the BJP, the worker who is motivated not by all these economic performances, it's fine. But it is the worker felt that the reason that they had given up and become Swayamsevaks was for a, another cause, the cause of Hindutva. And therefore, he did not work. And he, they lost and BJP became half its strength. In 2014, certainly the personality of Modi is very is important. But the driving force is not only anti-corruption, but more importantly, the ability to make people rise above their caste and vote for us. Our vote went from 21%, the maximum ever, to 31%. And that 31% plus our allies, we came to 38 and we got absolute majority. Every time people predict that we are going to lose election, they suddenly find that we are winning the election. In UP, demonetization woes were at the maximum. And we got 75% of the seats. And we did not put up a single Muslim candidate and people said, 125 seats now gone out of your hands. In those 125 seats, we won 85 seats in the UP Assembly. Of course, the reason was that 50% of the Muslim population, namely women, said there is only one party which will get us, save us from triple talaq, and that is BJP, so we'll vote for them. So earlier on, the Hindus used to be divided and the minorities were united. Now the opposite is happening. I predict to you that even Gujarat will win. Despite all the anger of GST, everything. Because when the time to vote comes, this base of Hindu unity and those progressive elements of the minority they will vote for us. And therefore, I'm saying that in this country, it's not money, it's not elections, whichever makes you win. Good economic performance is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Sufficient condition, you need some emotion. Bangladesh war will give Mrs. Gandhi a huge majority. In our case, it is the social transformation through the Torah. Now, I've come back, therefore, to say that Soviet model went off and then this economic, sheer concentration on economic reforms, that is not going to produce electoral success and in economic and in democracy, you have to factor that in also, that you have to win elections to continue the thing. But after that, I found that there are certain new institutions that were set in place, which has made the problem of black money even more untractable. One is this Mauritius route. And the Mauritius route, according to Professor, is not due to the Congress, but due to 
the NDA of Adal Bihari Vajpayee and Mr. Yashwant Sinha. So next time he comes here to give a speech, please ask him. After reading his book, I am not saying this, you are saying this. <laughs> so, use his book and say, this is what he said, is it true? It is a fact that malicious was given a special status. That anything of, of a Mauritius company will be exempt from taxes. In, for example, in BSE, anyone makes a capital gains, I think you charge 25% or something like that. Uh, what is the charge for capital gains in, uh, in Bombay stocks? Sure. But if your company is registered in Mauritius, zero. Plus, this participatory notes was also introduced, which I have been fighting to abolish come a, quite a long way, but not enough. Where black money goes out, converts into, uh, part, uh, in, uh, you know, through Awala to bank deposits, and then the cash is put before the counters of Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. They give you a participatory note. You come here, trade in the stock market and no capital gains tax and the money becomes white and you take it back. So these are the ones which have made it profitable to earn on black money. The portion that you don't send abroad ends up distorting your investment priorities. You buy luxuries, you buy marble, you buy air conditioners, you go to five star hotels. All these get a higher rate of return so future investment goes into it. Our investment directly, indirectly today, 75% allocated to luxury goods industry, not to the common man's industries. Whatever the common man needs, does, gets only 30%. This is because uh, the demand for black money is such that the luxury goods industry is prepared. Then there is another problem. You convert your black money through the Havala route. That means Dubai. Dubai means Daud. Daud means without his patronage, no Havala operator can operate in Dubai. That is why all these cinema stars go and pay obedience to him. And then he gets all the data, which bank account, what uh, number, everything, an amount, the identity of the person, and that is passed on to Pakistan. With this vital information, any country can blackmail you. And that blackmail process is going on. Now it's slowly coming out. You are not seeing, we are not seeing it in Indian politicians yet. But what is this Mohim Qureshi matter? They didn't prosecute it for such a long time. The CBI director himself was purchased by Mohim Qureshi. Now you are prosecuting them. I will say one thing, if you don't allow uh, uh, my, my doing propaganda, for all that is said against BJP today, the Congress party has not been able to name a single minister of the central government who is corrupt or has filed a case against him. <laughs> Some people say, why don't you file? I said, why should I file? I file against Congress, Congress should file against us. That's the way democracy works. Why should I file against my own people? First of all, you identify who is the one who is corrupt, then I can, I can at least discuss with you. But they cannot understand. I have asked them, each congressman directly, name one Congress, corrupt Congress, uh, BJP minister. They are not able to. This is the first time since 1947 when we don't have corrupt ministers in the central government. <laughs> Nehru had Krishna Menon, Nehru had Rafi Ahmad Kidwai, Nehru had so many uh, corrupt people. Indira Gandhi is, starting with Indira Gandhi, the corruption has started. <laughs> so, this is a new development. And that's why certain things are happening which never happened before. Then, Mohin Goyeshi is the examples there. Mr. So Chinambaram is just outside the doors of TR jail. It's only, only today. 
Only today the Supreme Court had gone and asked for an early listing of the matter because the court is monitoring the... And his son, of course, has got 21 bank accounts abroad. A huge mansion jointly owned with Chidambaram in the city of Cambridge in England. Huge mansion. And God knows what all assets they have. Similarly, Sonia Gandhi, Prime Minister in his speeches says, they are both out of bail. Who got them on bail? It is I, National Herald. It is not the government of India. It is I who filed a private complaint. And in the private complaint, a summons was issued. And then I prima facie proved the charges, so the court arrested them. And then they asked for bail. I did not object because if they had gone to jail just for, you know, without uh, a final conviction, then there would have been bhajan mandalis outside their jail to make them uh, heroes and heroines. And all the upkeep and all these problems. So it's better to wait till the conviction. And look at, let me repeat to you what National Herald case is. It's the biggest fraud perpetrated in modern corporate history. National Herald was published by a company called Associated Journals, which was set up in 1937 at 10 rupees a share. Jawaharlal Nehru bought only one share, and all others like Acharya Narendra Dev, Rafi Ahmed Kidwai, etc., Kalash Nath Kadju, etc., etc., they bought 100 shares, 20 shares like that. And Jawaharlal Nehru was chosen as chairman by them all. There were 10 persons as required under 10 or 11 persons as required under the Societies Act. And they became a company. And it ran during the freedom struggle, it got a lot of money because people wanted to know. After Jawaharlal Nehru became Prime Minister, then they got a lot of money, a lot of property. In the end, in 2008, they had 5,000 crores worth of property, but had a debt of 90 crores, which they claimed was owned by Congress party. That is, Congress party had given them 90 crores over the years, and that was an unpaid debt, and they couldn't pay, which is a lie, because you have 5,000 crores of worth of property, you can certainly sell some of it and pay 90 crores. They closed it down. Having closed it down, Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi formed a company called Young Indian, private limited company. 86%, 80% of the shares owned by the mother and son. And then they passed a resolution with other directors present, Motila Gora, Oscar Fernandez and two others, Sam Petroda and Suman Dubey, and say that we should we should try and acquire National Health Company Associated Journals. So Motilal Bora, director of the Young Indian, should go and talk to the Congress party and say that your 90 crores cannot be now because the company is closed down. So we are giving you 50 lakhs. It's a 5 lakh company, huh? this Young Indian of Sonia Gandhi. And somehow they produce 50 lakhs from a company called Doltex in Cal Calcutta, which they, when the enforcement director went said, this ours is what is called as an entry company. Or, you know, uh, what you do is that you give them cash and they'll put you in an account. So 50 lakhs came from that, that's another separate investigation. But Motilal Loro went and spoke to the Congress party treasurer. That you can't recover this money, here's 50 lakhs, assign it to us. Now, immediately the treasurer agreed. Guess who the treasurer was? Motilal Vora. <laughs> so Motilal Vora went and talked to Motilal Vora and got this <laughs> young Indian. Then, having got this loan assigned to them, this debt assigned to them, Motilal Vora goes and talks to the National Herald Company Associated Journals, to the chairman of the board of directors, and says, your company is gone, finished, so, we will buy your company, you issue 90, 9 crores of 10 rupees each, which means 90 crores, and assign it to us. 
I mean, in, a, in our name, National uh, I mean, Young Indian. Uh, so, the chairman of the board says, I'll talk to the board. The board meeting is called. The chairman is also Nauti Lanbora. <laughs> Director is uh, Oscar Fernandez and Suman Dube and uh, Motilal Bora, of course, and uh, Oscar and uh, these four people. <clears throat> and they pass a resolution that this nine crores be given, and this nine crores is then issued. There is no shareholders meeting. There is no reason why it should be priced at 10 rupees when you have 5,000 crores worth of property. All the company laws are violated and the company becomes national uh, company, now becomes the wholly owned subsidiary of Young India. That's the fraud. Everything is complete. I need, I had photostat copies, so I've asked for original documents. So there is a procedure under the criminal procedure code to ask for these documents, and that probably next month I should get them. Then the trial will not take more than there are no witnesses, nothing. It's all documents. So, maybe by next May, we will have some new tenants in <laughs> On the 7th of November, it's possible that Kanyamori and Rahaja will go. After that, Chidambaram will go with his son. Maybe his wife also in the Shada Chit Fund, she might also be there, the whole family reunion take place. <laughs> I've told many times to people a joke because the, the TR tales, Subhanan is known to me, he told me, it's, it's, please don't send so many madrasis to <laughs> jail because the Bhavarachi, the cook, only knows how to make aloo puri, but these people want masal dosa and meat and so on. I told him, get another cook so that he can make some pizza and pasta and all that. That's also <laughs> The working committee of the Congress may meet in the RJ <laughs> at the very thing center. But there is nothing personal in this. They have looted this country's money. They are abroad, we know it. Why is it not possible to bring it back? Because the thing that we need to do, which I have told the Prime Minister, he asked me for a note and I gave him a note. <coughs> the thing we have to do, there are many ways, he mentioned the German way, that is bribe the uh, bank officials and get it. The French also did the same thing. The Americans threatened uh, the bank officials that will put you in jail and they surrendered to the Americans. There are many ways of doing it. But the most simplest way which was followed by Egypt to get Mubarak's account, uh, Libya to get uh, Gaddafi's account, and Philippines to get Marco's account was the route through the United Nations Convention of 2005. That I think you barely mentioned in your book. Uh, but that's the one that needs to be developed. So if you have your second edition, please devote a special uh, page, chapter to UN thing and give me a free copy as my royalty. <laughs> now, what is that United Nations? 2005 United Nations, Americans are now today concerned about black money. Why? Because it's terror financing. You know these participatory notes were used for terror financing. The National Security Advisor Mr. M.K. Narayanan told this in an open conference in Germany. That one of the biggest problems we have with black money is this. So now the Americans are very concerned. They are very keen that you know financing should be completely monitored and checked. And therefore, what you do is we have ratified, we have uh, signed the Convention of the United Nations 2005. But the government of UPA refused to deposit those uh, protocols which the United Nations requires. That's a five minute work. You do it, then the United Nations empowers you to pass a law 
I mean, that is, uh, it empowers you to get, collect your, the, the money abroad. If you pass a law in your parliament, which you can do by an ordinance to make it quick, because nobody else will object to it, stating that all Indian citizens' accounts in 70 countries where secret banking or what uh, by new methods or you say, what, what is the new terminology you say? Yeah. Uh, illicit uh, new environment or something. Uh, not tax haven, you said tax haven is gone now, you have said illicit uh, dispensation or something. Anyway. So, now 70 countries have secret banking. So, any Indian's account in any of these 70 countries is hereby nationalized. And the United Nations will help you get all this money, the bank accounts, the names, and give it to you. Like they did for Marcos, they did for um, um, uh, uh, that uh, Egyptian leader, uh, Mubarak, and for Gaddafi. They will do it for you, and you will get, according to me, one point three uh, lakh, no, you, it, yeah, one trillion, yes, one trillion dollars, multiplied by 70, that be 70 trillion rupees. My God, you don't need any taxes, you don't need anything, you don't need a budget also. I don't think you need a finance minister also. <laughs> we anyway don't need this all. <laughs> so, therefore, why don't we do it? The finance ministry keeps emphasizing DTA, Direct Taxes Avoidance Act. But then, Manmohan Singh and Pranam Mukherjee have done something which we are not changing, which is they went and told Switzerland, yes, we will participate in this, but from henceforth, prospective, we will not do the retrospective uh, assessments. So that has become completely useless, DTWA, which they keep quoting. Only way to get black money bank form for abroad is to use the United Nations Convention of 2005 and pass a, a law nationalizing all bank accounts. You'll get the money. Then you don't have to have taxes. One of the things I've noticed is that there are new ways to raise resources now. 2G spectrum, after that, what happened? They auctioned it, they got 3 lakh crores. Another year, they got 4 lakh crores. Then, soon 3G is going to be auctioned, 4G, 5G, we have got at least 2019 and probably 2024 also, we have got enough auctioning opportunities. <laughs> coal blocks, you well, auction the coal blocks, you get 11 lakh crores. What is the total income tax revenue of our economy, uh, according to the uh, uh, annual budget? 5 lakh crores. 5 lakh crores you can get by alternative means. In fact, today, if you want to generate confidence in the country, the first step you should do is abolishing income tax. And the second thing you should say is there is only one tax, 8% GST, nothing else. No forms to fill. Just pay 8%. I was not very much in favor of GST, and I knew that GST will, will collapse, it has almost collapsed. But tomorrow if you say that no, no, all these gradations, this thing, nothing, only 8%, people will pay voluntarily. You can save the GST even today by that. So you do that, there will be enthusiasm. Of course, the stock market won't boom then because presently they don't know what to do with their money. Everybody is putting in the stock market. <laughs> and that's why the stock market is booming. But uh, in my opinion, this economy can grow at 10 to 12 percent continuously for 10 years. You will become a developed country. You will overtake China. And you will be then face to face with America 
and our conflict with America is only in one dimension, that is innovation, and we are smarter than the Americans, given the opportunity, we will overtake America in another 30 years. So that is the, what the black money is doing, is corroding you. It is creating the impression that there are easier ways of making money than working hard. The shortcut mentality is ruining our young people. And this new westernized materialistic ideology that money is everything, that, in my opinion, will destroy us. We must have our old values back that money is not an index of social stature. <laughs> Learning is, fighting for the country is, philanthropy is, working hard in agriculture is. And therefore, this new value system will make you more happy. I've just come after spending five days with C.C. Jamshankar in, in Bangalore, in his ashram. And there were so many foreigners there, very well to do. And I asked them, why have you come? He said, to become happy. She, she teaches us how to become happy. I said, you can't be happy in America. I said, we have tried, it doesn't work. Because this materialism leads to greed. Greed leads to corruption and exploitation. <coughs> American society is not a happy society. They have produced tremendous innovations, we admire them for that. But this society has survived the worst possible attacks from abroad and still, still it is one single society. People have predicted their country will break into 20 countries, nothing of the kind happened. Soviet Union broke into 16 countries. Yugoslavia broke into four. Pakistan broke into two. Indonesia has also broken into two. But this country about whom everybody predicted will break up has not broken up and will not break up because of this basic quality that people are willing to make sacrifices. Our army, an American told me, Indian army has the highest casualty of captains and uh, lieutenant colonels than any other army in the world. I said, what do you mean? He said, they lead from the front. Whereas the American army does not have these uh, uh, captains and majors equivalent leading from the front. In, uh, in, in uh, Kargil, there was this steep slope. The charge was led by captains. So many died. This, this country therefore has that commitment and we have to make it worthwhile, that commitment. And the only way that we can do it by fighting black money, and I would say Mr. Narendra Modi should devote the whole of next year only for eliminating black money and nothing else, put up a war thing and get it back. And it is doable. And one of the ways you can do is appoint uh, Professor Vaidnanda as black money commissioner. <laughs> so, there is talent in this country, there is no shortage of talent. Get them and give them this task. And in my opinion, it can be done in three months. So I think this book is most appropriate. And uh, uh, I wish him well. I would like him to write more books. Um, and uh, I've always been with him for all, all on this day. When he mentioned Gitanjali, he didn't mention she's my daughter, by the way. You forgot that. She, my daughter went to Harvard business school and then she's now a financial expert in the United States, her husband, who she met in, uh, when she was studying at IIT Kanpur, he's now a professor of computer science, so they are both settled down there. But somehow, she, when she comes, she goes to meet him, but she rarely meets me, <laughs> because she says, you are always on tour, it's much easier to meet him. Uh, anyway, the fact is that he inspires students, he inspires people. I think he should be facilitated to set up a think tank 
which deals with how to eliminate black money. Thank you very much. <laughs>